Good afternoon, Hoosiers. Thank you for joining us. We've got a full program today, so I will get right at it. Uh, Dr. Box will follow me. Uh, Dr. Weaver will present an update on our vaccination process. We'll also hear from two guests uh, representing two of our largest business organizations and associations in the state of Indiana, the State Chamber of Commerce, the President and CEO, Kevin Brenniger, and the president of the Indiana Manufacturing Association, Brian Burton. They will join us to give us their perspective on how things are going, you know, 10 months into this uh, together. Also, you'll recall in just a month ago, not even a full month ago, in uh, November, we announced that we were going to be shifting to a more locally um, driven pandemic um, requirements based and reaction um, regarding the, the level of positivity and spread, the number of cases per 100,000 residents. And the metrics show, obviously, a county, whether it's in blue, yellow, orange, or red, what that spread is. If it's um, blue, there's relatively little or a slow spread. And if it's red, it is raging. And, uh, and just a month later, I mean, just to put this in perspectives, um, we obviously monitor COVID patients, hospital rates, um, ICU and vent availability. A month later, after we made that um, announcement, uh, the state of Indiana, when you, when you talk about counties being red, the state of Indiana is on fire. And so just to put this all in context or perspective, every one of our 92 counties is red in terms of one of the ways we measure this the number of cases per 100,000 residents unfortunately we're now second we topped that list about a week ago um, in terms of um, in terms of throughout the nation a uh, place where we never want to be and I don't want us to linger in this neighborhood uh, longer than we are um, but we have more counties in red for positivity levels this week than we did uh, last week. Our seven-day rolling rate is now at 14 percent uh, positivity rate. The number of hospitalized COVID patients has risen to over 3,200 people. That's statewide, obviously. Daily admissions are 400, north of 400. Um, and so we're adding every single day on top of that baseline. Our nurses and our doctors, understandably, assistants um, are overwhelmed and beyond exhausted. I mean, they are trying to recharge their batteries maybe one day a week to go into one of the toughest environments um, that anyone in our state's history um, has had to face on a day in day out basis or endure all on behalf of trying to make other people better and and so we have got to our plan and our uh, path forward has got to react to that reality uh, in an effort to preserve hospital intensive care unit capacity and try to lessen that strain and that stress, quite frankly, uh, of our of our healthcare workers and their ability to provide that care. Um, we will be asking and not just asking, but directing uh, all of our hospitals to postpone or reschedule, and this is key, um, all non-emergent, in, in my terms, urgent or um, critical um, inpatient um, in the hospital setting, which is key, uh, elective procedures that can be safely postponed and or delayed uh, for a three-week period. We'll be, this will be concerning December 16th through January 3rd. So we'll obviously be extending the executive order. That probably goes without saying, considering our numbers. But that is uh, nothing I just want to gloss over. This is, this is a directive that I don't take lightly. I understand the impact this will have um, on our hospital network overall. We have talked to them not just weekly, but but daily. Um, you, you've, you're probably on the phone with a hospital, if not multiple hospitals, 
Many times a week. Many times a week, yeah. And and daily, and Dr. Weaver, and Dr. Um, Dan, and um, Dr. Doss, et cetera, um, making sure that we are um, best informed as we make decisions to try to free up and give some relief, quite frankly, to some of our patients. And we know coming off of Thanksgiving um, and the numbers as they continue that that tide continues to rise and so what we're trying to project what does high tide look like and avoid it and that comes back to our obviously our actions and so all this is is in a single attempt to try to bring down that crest um, and slow the spread we're not alone in this uh, as, as I've mentioned on this show multiple times uh, I'm in constant communication was with 20 plus governors last night um, and and others have have recently gone down this path as well uh, but let me emphasize to anyone that is watching that if you have a serious medical condition um, you should go see your doctor now and you should uh, make sure that you go to a hospital to get that uh, your your inquiry addressed. And if it is emergent, critical, um, you still should have that procedure done. And so this is only procedures that can be postponed or delayed over this three-week period so we can try to clear out some beds, give some relief uh, to our hospital uh, personnel and network. But please, get get... Don't just seek it, get it, the attention, um, if you need it. I'm also glad, and I just wanted to touch on for a second, I'm also glad to see more leaders and more individual communities um, taking actions to help uh, their residents, quite frankly, understand just how widespread the depth and breadth of this virus and how it impacts um, not just our daily lives, but... Um, our routines for sure, but also, um, you know, events that we want to take part in that only roll around once ever so often, Thanksgiving, uh, the holidays that we're cruising into at the tail end of this month and the beginning of next year. And, and I'm heartened, quite frankly, by the number of leaders around the state who have said, yes, we've got to get through this next few weeks and do all we can. Uh, Howard County just recently um, self-adjusted, according to the color-coded map, they self-adjusted and said, we see where we're going, and we're gonna, we're gonna ratchet up to red, uh, even though we're in the um, orange category currently right now. And, and uh, I think that's being proactive. It's not waiting on your numbers to get to where you can see them, the trajectory um, pointing. But beginning this weekend, again, I said the 16th through the 3rd, beginning this um, weekend, so we'll have a week lead up for our hospitals to reschedule, et cetera. So it's not just you know tomorrow. Um, but beginning this weekend, we will cap all social gatherings at the limit imposed by the county metrics. So we're going to allow individuals or entities to seek permission from their local health departments to host larger events, the social no longer. So I want to stress that this is, this is the cap. This is our state requirement. Um, so social gathering limits are 25 uh, people max if you're in red, 50 people. Um, for counties in orange, 100 people if you're in yellow, 250 people in blue counties. We just know when you, you're, you're balancing the spread and you're balancing a, a large number of people coming together, and that's where you see this exponential um, rate uh, literally, as we see it, start to spin out of control and, and management. So we've got an opportunity here uh, to, to address this, but we're going to have to take steps to do just that. I want nothing more, and we're seeing this play out all across our state, um, our youngsters to be in class when it's safe to be uh, in class. Um, and, and we want our K through 12 extracurricular and co-curricular 
um, activities to continue, but attendance will be limited to participants, to support personnel, um, to parents, to um, guardians, um, plus, you know, the, the uh, their minor children for counties in that red metric, we have to we have to be aware of what color your county is. And so those in blue, yellow, or orange, um, the limit capacity of 25 percent uh, in in consultation, of course, with your local health department, college and professional um, venues, sports. Uh, may continue with with uh, participants, support personnel as well, and family members. The local health department obviously um, is involved in these larger uh, venues and can approve your plan um, for fan attendance up to 25% capacity. What what I have seen in others um, are these venues have have proven that they can do this safely, and so it's a it's a case example of, uh, of of how to do it and do it safely. Understanding that we have to make sure that we're continuing to wear our our masks. We have a mask mandate. Obviously, a lot of other folks do too um, now because we just understand how this virus is transmitted. Uh, so that will that will continue to be in effect. Uh, face coverings for all Hoosiers. And I'll just say that, um, Dr. Box, you're 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 seeing this and all the um, data that comes in and cr and crunching it, but it all points to one thing, and it's a it's just a trajectory. It's an exponential rise. Yeah, and from I mean November to December, stark difference. Mm -hmm. And you were you didn't have a crystal ball, but you were. Um, predicting where this could where this could go and so there's a few things um, that we know I, I, I wrote up my own little top 10 list just <laughs> jotting down trying to not oversimplify this but just a list of 10 things that um, if we do it will make a positive difference on where we are one month from where we sit today it's obviously limiting the size of your gatherings by following those red, orange, yellow, and blue um, metrics. That's, again, pausing or delaying those non-emergent elective surgical procedures to free up beds that are done in the inpatient um, hospital setting. Wear a mask when you're around others. Keep six feet apart if you can't be more than, uh, or, or keep six feet apart regardless, but if you can't be, make sure that you have that mask on. Wash your hands throughout the day. Get tested if you're sick or symptomatic. Stay home if you get a positive COVID-19 test result. Isolate yourself so that you're not um, spreading. Um, also, something that has become becoming more and more effective is the communications, and this is why I'm, I'm really looking forward to hearing from um, Kevin Brenniger and Brian Burton is employers please talk to your employees what we see so often is the safest place someone is all day long is at work but it's what happens outside of work that it is then brought back into work that then forces whether you're a hospital a f factory or a small business then it forces people to either isolate or be quarantined and 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 so all the communication that's being done in our business community is not just appreciated. I think it's essential um, that folks know just um, the effect that that has, what is going on outside the workplace. Give blood if you're able. Um, we've, we've mentioned that multiple times um, throughout the last 10 months, never more important than it is now, and it was. It, I could have said that last month um, as well. But these, you know, the blood donation, um, shortages are, are there and they're real and, and many people can help so if you can food pantry is the same heading into the holidays um, if you're able please consider that and then you'll hear more from dr. Weaver here in just a second um, after dr. Box's full report but stay tuned 
um, on the vaccination process. Obviously, this is, you know, you've got the manufacturing part of it, you've got the um, distribution phase, and then you've got the administration phase, actually putting a shot or, in the, in the first case, shots, plural, um, in the arm. And so we're going to make sure that we're keeping you updated on a week in, week out basis, but stay tuned to that. And, and, and if I could, I know I'm sounding like I'm droning on here and we got a lot to get to, but the fact that we're even talking about a vaccine into this week or next week. It's incredible. Is a modern medical miracle. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, when I, I checked to see just how long it took for, you know, other vaccines to be developed, approved, and deployed, and it's four years for mumps, and seven years for polio, and nine years for measles, and 34 years for chickenpox. Mm -hmm. And we're 10 months into this, and trials completed, and, and soon to be approved multiple. And so when, when Dr. Lindsay Weaver gives her report, you know, this is an ever-changing, evolving process because as production, as supply becomes more, we're able to then obviously pass that on, and we'll do that very efficiently. So with all that, you've probably got your own top ten list. I just hope <laughs> I'm on your nice list. <laughs> all I want for Christmas is for Hoosiers to wear their masks, oh, sir. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, Governor. Good afternoon, Hoosiers. The steps being announced today are absolutely necessary as the pandemic tightens its grip on our state. I certainly share your belief that we are in a place that none of us want to be, and I want Hoosiers um, to look at our color-coded maps in further detail. At the beginning of each week, our three color-coded maps come out from our data team. Most people go directly to the two-metric map and see which counties have changed color or stayed the same. Lately, that has not really mattered because all of our counties have high community spread. We have no counties in blue or yellow and 36 in red. That's more than twice as many as last week, and that clearly shows that this surge is far from over. But I focus a lot personally on the map showing cases per 100,000 residents. This is the fourth consecutive week in which all 92 counties have been in red. I just want to take a minute to remind you about the cutoffs for each of our colors based on this metric of cases per 100,000 Hoosiers. Blue would be less than 10 cases per 100,000 Hoosiers. Yellow, 10 to 99 cases per 100,000 Hoosiers. Orange, 100 to 199 new cases. And red, greater than 200 cases. We do not have a single county below 200 cases per 100,000 residents, and we haven't had one for four weeks. In fact, only two counties are even below 400 cases per 100,000, and we have seven counties over 1,000 cases per 100,000 residents. This represents a huge number of infected and sick Hoosiers, all of whom will infect others. The significant community spread of COVID-19 has made it extremely difficult for local public health officials who are trying to provide testing, do contact tracing, and also plan for the arrival of vaccines. So new statewide limits will create consistency across the state at a time when we are all equally affected. It also will allow public health staff to focus on those critical priorities of contact tracing, testing, and vaccination planning. The decision to postpone non-emergent hospital procedures reflects the fact that our hospital systems are stretched to the limit. Our cases continue to rise exponentially, and this is, in, is, is resulting in more hospitalizations. Today, that number was 3,244, which is an 84% increase over our hospitalization rate in November. We also had 480 admitted for COVID or COVID-like symptoms as of November 30th, compared with 225 who were admitted on November 1st. As the governor noted, beds are in short supply in many hospitals, and many have had to redirect patients to other facilities, known as going on diversion, because they don't have the space or the staffing to manage this increasing number of patients. 
Staffing in hospitals around the holidays is always more difficult, and we know that our health care workforce is already exhausted. By postponing non-emergent procedures done in an inpatient setting, we will be able to free up preoperative and postoperative staff and OR staff to be able to provide relief for these weary COVID warriors. We also continue to see an increasing number of deaths, especially among individuals over the age of 80. Many of these Hoosiers are residents of long-term care facilities and represent members of our greatest generation. In the past two days alone, we have reported more than 220 deaths due to COVID. In total, 6,207 Hoosiers are confirmed to have died from COVID, and nearly 300 others are considered probable deaths based on their clinical diagnosis. These losses are simply heartbreaking. Every Hoosier has been impacted by COVID-19 this year. We all want life to get back to normal. But to go there, we must continue to use the to tools that we have at our disposal. That means wearing a mask, staying home and socially distancing, and most importantly, making those hard choices around holiday gatherings. It also means responding to contact tracers and letting those you've been in close contact with know if you test positive. I want to be clear that we have not abandoned contact tracing. The state is on track to have 1,300 contact tracers in our centralized operation by the end of the year. What we have done is shortened our contact tracing questionnaire in hopes of reaching more people. Those changes are helping tremendously. We compared results from the old, longer script the last week of November to the first week of the shorter script and found that the number of cases interviewed grew by 25% from the prior week that total inbound and outbound calls at the central contact tracing operation were up 27%. The contact tracers are still having to leave a voicemail many times, so I encourage Hoosiers to answer the call when you see this number, 833-670-0067, pop up. By answering the call, you're helping to prevent further spread of COVID. We've been dealing with this pandemic now for the better part of a year. I know Hoosiers are tired. I'm tired. But I want to remind you that we are all looking across the water and seeing our destination on the other side. That destination includes being able to worship together, celebrate with our families, tailgate at a football game with our friends, or even be in school or work without the fear of getting this infection. That destination, realistically, though, is still about six months away. The vaccine gives us the way forward to reclaiming the lives that we feel like we've lost. But we still have to cross that bridge of time to get there. A bridge built on mask wearing, hand washing, social distancing, and yes, limiting our hospital celebrations to prevent the spread of this disease so that we can have many more years together to celebrate. These mitigation measures can still have profound consequences like saving lives and decreasing prolonged and maybe even permanent health effects. Now it's my pleasure to turn it over to Dr. Weaver who will talk about the vaccine and how it will help us to further get to the other side of this pandemic. Lindsay. Thank you, Dr. Box. Tomorrow an FDA subcommittee is expected to approve the first COVID-19 vaccine. This approval of the Pfizer vaccine is one of the final steps before the FDA could grant an emergency use authorization that allows a vaccine to be shipped to states. This is incredibly exciting news because it signals the beginning of the end of this pandemic. But as Dr. Box noted, we still have a long journey ahead of us. The first very limited vaccines are expected to arrive in Indiana next week. The initial doses will go to our five pilot hospitals, Clark Memorial in Jeffersonville, Deaconess in Evansville, IU Methodist in Indianapolis, Community Hospital in Munster, and Parkview in Fort Wayne. Additional doses are expected to be available at a total of 50 hospitals by the end of next week. Based on our initial allocation, we will receive 55,575 doses of vaccine. These vaccines will go to frontline healthcare workers who are at risk of exposure to COVID-19 while providing direct care to patients. This includes hospital staff 
and employees of long-term care facilities. We anticipate receiving additional vaccines every week, but we do not know what those amounts will be. We are excited to share that CVS and Walgreens are partnering with us to provide vaccine to our long-term care residents and staff who do not receive it at our hospital sites. Through this partnership, we are assuring our most vulnerable Hoosiers and those that care for them are the first in line for this pandemic or for this vaccination. We expect to remain to focus on our healthcare workforce and our long-term care residents into January. Many people have asked, who is next in line? We have reviewed the recommendations from our national experts in the ethical allocation of COVID-19, including the CDC's ACIP, which is the Advisory Committee of Immunization Practices, who currently lists essential workers next, but will formally vote at a later date. Other um, national experts recognize the importance of prioritizing vaccinating our vulnerable populations. We recognize that many members of vulnerable populations also are essential workers, so we anticipate that there will be overlap among the groups when we reach the next phase. As we learn more about which vaccines we can expect, the safety and efficacy, and how much we will receive, we will continue to review the national recommendations and rely on the guidance of our statewide multidisciplinary vaccine advisory committee who continues to meet on a regular basis. At this time, we can't predict when we will move into the next phase because it will depend, like I said, on vaccine supplies as well as how many Hoosiers choose to get the vaccine. We continue to hear from people who say they are hesitant to get the vaccine. The biggest concern is safety. We also get questions about how effective it is. It's important to understand how vaccines work. Many vaccines put a weakened or inactivated germ into our bodies, but these vaccines that we will be receiving first are mRNA vaccines, and they take a different approach. They teach our cells how to make a harmless protein called the spike protein that is found on the surface of the virus that causes COVID-19. This protein then triggers an immune response inside our bodies. That immune response produces antibodies to protect us from getting infected if the real virus enters our bodies. These vaccines cannot give someone COVID-19. They do not use live virus. They also don't interact or affect our DNA in any way. While this will be the first mRNA vaccine approved for use, researchers have been studying this and working on these vaccines for decades. One question you might have is how well will the vaccine work and how long the vaccine will provide immunity to COVID-19. Trials for both the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines are currently reporting them to be 95% effective, meaning that participants who received the vaccine had 95% fewer cases of COVID-19 compared to those who did not receive it. We are several months out from trial participants receiving their second dose of vaccine. Moderna recently reported that participants who received the vaccine continue to show an antibody response three months after their second dose. The vaccines will likely provide longer immunity, but how long will be determined as more time passes and the trial participants are monitored. It is important to mention that it is imperative for people who will be getting the vaccine to get the second dose in order to receive the full immunity benefit. I want to emphasize that these vaccines have undergone rigorous testing and review for safety. While I know there were reports of a couple allergic reactions in the United Kingdom, the side effects in general are temporary and have been found to be in line with what we see with other immunizations, such as pain at the injection site, headache, fatigue, and occasionally a low-grade fever. We will review all data that comes with the vaccines and make sure we recommend it for those who it is appropriate. We take similar steps with flu vaccines each year when we ask people about allergic reactions. Some vaccines may not be appropriate for specific individuals, or they may be advised to be monitored for an extended period of time after administration. We have the benefit of the knowledge gained from the hundreds of thousands of people from around the world, from all races and ethnicities, who volunteered for the COVID-19 vaccine trials. The vaccine was found to be equally effective in all of these populations, and the side effects were similar among all groups. I encourage any Hoosier who isn't sure about the vaccine to look at the research behind these vaccines and know that no vaccine is released unless it passes very rigorous testing. As we begin vaccinating our first Hoosiers, I want to extend our gratitude to those selfless individuals whose willingness to help scientists will provide us with our best tool yet to end this pandemic. Thank you, Dr. Weaver. I think we have, Rachel, a video that we're going to brief 
video that we're going to share, and then we'll go to um, Kevin Brenninger and Brian Burton. The COVID-19 vaccine is now making its way to Indiana, and that means it's time to start planning for your immunization. We know you have a lot of questions about the vaccine and how we plan to distribute it across the state. And right now, our priority is making sure that people who need it most get it first. We'll keep you updated as the situation changes, but for now, here's what we know. Why should I get a vaccine? First of all, we know that everyone should get the vaccine once it is available. These vaccines have been thoroughly tested to ensure that they help protect people from COVID-19. In clinical trials, the vaccines are proven to prevent COVID-19 symptoms in nearly 95% of vaccinated patients. So, we know that these vaccines are safe, and we know that they're effective. Now we need everyone to get vaccinated to help stop the pandemic. The best way to protect yourself, your family, and our community is to get vaccinated as soon as you can. When will I get the vaccine? A few factors will determine when you can get the vaccine. Our distribution timeline will depend on how quickly the vaccine arrives in Indiana, as well as your unique situation. Right now, the vaccine is in limited supply. So we plan to start by vaccinating our healthcare personnel and long-term care residents. Then, depending on our supplies, we will begin vaccinating other at-risk people and critical infrastructure workers. Keep in mind that children under the age of 16 will not be receiving the vaccine at this time because those clinical trials have not been completed. As for everyone else, we ask for your patience. At this time, we hope that everyone will have the opportunity to get vaccinated by next summer. We will keep you updated on our distribution plan as we receive more vaccines. And in the meantime, we'll keep answering your questions. Thank you, Dr. Weaver. Again, I recognize that voice. Uh, and now we'll go to the president of the Indiana State Chamber of Commerce and then on to Brian Burton, the president of the Indiana Manufacturers Association. Kevin, um, you're up first. You've got members in every community in the state of Indiana. And you've, you've heard a lot of, quite frankly, inspirational stories, some of which you've shared with me, yes. about how they've had to make changes and, and, and step up their communications like never before. Can you just share your somewhat unique perspective on where we are 10 months into this now? Certainly. Thank you, Governor and um, Dr. Box and Dr. Weaver. Uh, um, uh, we very much appreciate the leadership and the courage uh, that you've shown through this very difficult pandemic. And uh, we support this very necessary uh, and temporary uh, set of orders that you're issuing today. Um, as we look at the employer community in Indiana, many of them are uh, recovering and doing okay. Uh, others are still struggling mightily and hanging on uh, by their thumbnails. And to underscore a point that you made earlier, um, overwhelmingly people are not getting infected in their place of work. And I can give you an example of that. Three weeks ago, I spoke to a member of ours who um, said that they had currently had 46 employees who were infected with the coronavirus, and they had documented that not a single one of them had contracted the virus inside their factory. It was from activities outside of the workplace. And that's why for our part, for the chamber's uh, part in this effort, we are uh, communicating to employers to strongly en or encourage them to urge their employees to maintain the same safety protocols that they exercise in the workplace during their activities that are out of the workplace, and it's the things we've heard over and over again, it's wearing masks, it's social distancing, and it's washing your hands and disinfecting and, and following those same precautions. Because we're not going to get our economy back to full strength, to full operation, until we can knock this virus down. And the recent spikes that we've seen uh, in, in recent weeks um, are cause for concern and are frankly cause for justifications for the, the new restrictions that you're imposing today. Thank you, Kevin, uh, very much. Uh, Brian, we're, the, we're proud to be the number one manufacturing state per capita in the country. Um, manufacturing, advanced manufacturing has helped us weather storms before, and they are indeed this one as well. But as I, as I mentioned to Kevin, your members have had to make uh, tremendous sacrifices and a lot of changes to to keep
keep production up. Can you share your perspective as well? Yes, they have, Governor. And let me uh, thank you for the opportunity to join the briefing today. It's no surprise that the pandemic has significantly impacted manufacturing, which is Indiana's largest industry employing over half a million Hoosiers. Governor, we appreciate your considered approach to seek to balance public health and also economic activity. I also want to applaud the many manufacturers across the state that have stepped up and changed production lines to produce and distribute personal protective equipment and other products for communities in our state. In manufacturing, they focus on safe, uh, safety in the workplace as part of our culture. We use personal protective equipment and safety products, uh, procedures that are built into our industry. But manufacturers are not isolated from the communities we live in. Our workers, associates, team members often travel across cities, counties, and even state boundaries to get to work. Many of our members have multiple facilities within the state. We also have challenges similar to other businesses with employees that are isolated because of exposure, have to care for sick family members, or have to deal with school and childcare limitations. So while we can and have worked to create a safe workplace environment, we need Indiana and our individual communities to be safe. We also have to think about the economy when we emerge from this pandemic, hopefully sometime next year, year early next year, if we can work together to get through the next few months, our industry is confident in renewed economic growth in Indiana. We need to look after each other now and enact policies that will spur investment and hiring, like passing a, a comprehensive COVID liability protection bill that includes those businesses that made PPE, cleaning supplies, and other pandemic-related products. Working together, Indiana manufacturers are poised to keep Indiana the number one state for manufacturing in America. Governor, our longtime motto has been what Indiana makes, Indi Indi what Indiana makes, makes Indiana. Let me modify that just a little bit for today. What Indiana does today will make Indiana's tomorrow. So it's very important uh, what we do today. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Um, message received. And just to underscore, and Rachel will get right to the Q&A portion. And... Um, Obviously, Dr. Box and Dr. Weaver will stay with us, but also um, Mr. Brenniger and Mr. Burton will also be staying with us during the Q&A portion. But Kevin and, and uh, Brian mentioned two words that kind of stick out. One was temporary, what we do today. Um, this isn't a never-ending uh, exercise. Uh, and two, balanced. Everything that we do, we have to make sure there's a a healthy balance in terms of our lives and livelihoods. Uh, Rachel? Nikki Kelly with the Fort Wayne Journal-Gazette. Good afternoon, Nikki. Good afternoon, Governor. I have a couple quick questions. Uh, the first is about on the vaccine discussion. A lot of counties are very concerned about how they're going to afford to be able to do these mass vaccinations. Yep. So I wonder how the state will help them given the federal money can't be used after January one. And the second question is, I'm a little confused on the 25 and 50 social gathering limits. It appears that, I, I guess I don't understand the picking and choosing. So you can't have 75 people at a wedding, but you can have 100 people at a high school football game or basketball game because their parents, yep. you can go to a Colts game and have thousands, but you can't have 50 people at a funeral. So can you discuss those things, please? Yep. Uh, you How about take I first? take the second one and the Lindsay take the first vaccine? Okay, take this and then I'll weigh into it. I'll, I'll okay. back clean up, but you go first okay. with the second, and then Lindsay will go to you for the first, and I'll back clean up. Okay, Thanks. sounds great. Um, so, Nikki, honestly, when we look at this, um, individual personal gatherings like weddings, funerals, uh, celebrations, parties are the times when people are most likely to be closer to take off their masks and more likely to get infected. And oftentimes those are in indoor spaces that really don't um, lend themselves well to the number of people that are there. And that is why for those procedures, we're going strictly based on whatever the color of your county is, that is the limit on the size. 
when you look at things like high school football, basketball, you look at things like the professional sports teams, number one, it's still at the discretion of our local public health officers to decide based on where their county is what they're comfortable with, but they cannot decide on anything above 25% of what that particular venue would hold. So that's, even though that can be a larger number of people in, say, the Pacers Arena, there's a lot of entrances coming in and out, a lot of bathrooms, a lot of people spread out, socially distanced and masked. Lindsay? Yes, Hal. So um, about how to afford paying for the vaccine clinics in order to be able to provide it. So the vaccine will be free to all people who receive it. However, places who are giving the vaccine can charge insurance for an administration fee. So that, again, there will never be a charge actually to the patients, um, but insurances can be billed for the administration fee to help offset that cost. Additionally, we are looking at ways at how we can support or local health departments and their vaccination plans. And we'll continue to monitor and evaluate the situation um, very carefully because we do not want that to be a barrier to people to be able to help provide this wonderful service to our community. Yeah, and I would just add, I mean, you said everything I would have, um, Dr. Box, in, in terms of the um, second question about limits and limitations. And, you know, we take this week by week, day by day, week by week, month by month. Um, we don't um, it, it's a balance, and you don't want to. You want to try to direct your attention on drawing down numbers where you have the most um, effective shot at actually bringing it down. And so, you know, we we look at things that are outdoors and or indoors, and where through tracing um, we see spread occurring and and Dr. Box just highlighted exactly why we made that decision and hopefully this will make a difference and and we just understand this comes at a rotten time of the year because um you know we just we just um asked Hoosiers to to celebrate Thanksgiving differently than any other time in our lives and and we saw a, a little tick down in mobility mm -hmm. but I mean, 10 or 15 percent. Not as much as we would have liked. Did to not think. make, I mean, maybe made a dent in it, who's to say, but not enough to bend that curve. And now we know we're going into the tail end in holidays where these very events and kids home from school, students home from school, um, and we're just, we're just being real. I mean, we're sharing with you the facts, and, and we want you to have a lot more Thanksgivings and, and holidays to celebrate. And so that's why right now, to your point, Nikki, that's fair. I mean, we are picking and choosing. We're trying to do that intelligently, and we're letting the data drive those decisions. Steve with KPC Media. Afternoon, Steve. Good afternoon. How are you doing today? Doing well. Yourself? Pretty good. Pretty good. Home, home on a COVID quarantine myself, oh. so... Oh doing my part to stop the spread. Uh, what, two questions what, what today. What day of uh, your sentence are you serving? Uh, I am in the within the first week still, so yeah. I've still got some time at home okay. with uh, my wife and my son here. So, uh, Yeah, uh, two questions. The first about vaccines, uh, the other about uh, the hospitalizations that we're seeing. Uh, on the vaccine front, I'm wondering whether there's any guidance for people who maybe have been infected before uh, you know, naturally from picking up the virus and, and recovered, whether uh, they will be recommended to get a vaccine at some point or if they'll be pushed down a priority list, um, you know, to maybe get it later since they may have some some immunity uh, going in. Uh, and then on the hospitalization front, since uh, the end of November, we've seen uh, total statewide hospitalization numbers tick down a little bit and kind of say stable. They haven't yeah you know, dropped a lot, but at least they're not increasing on a daily basis at the rate that they had been, you know, prior to that. So I'm wondering if you're seeing some positives in, in that metric. Lindsay, do you want to take that first vaccine question and I'll follow up with the hospitalizations? 
Yes, absolutely. So people who have had COVID-19 will be recommended to get the vaccine. In the very beginning now, when we have such, it's such a scarce resource and we have a finite number, people who have had COVID-19 in the last 90 days and have recovered may be asked to delay a little bit to let those people who are wanting those antibodies to help protect themselves to get to the front of line. But um, eventually we will ask anybody, whether you've had COVID or not, to, to um, go ahead and get the COVID-19 vaccine. And with regards to hospitalizations, it's great that we've not seen them um, ticking up significantly. What I will say is that you have to remember it takes a while. There's a lag time, um, maybe as long as 10 days, two weeks before we start to see individuals um, in the age group that are sick enough that need to be hospitalized. And then they don't just go in one day and come back out, right? They're there for a week, two weeks, three weeks, sometimes even longer. So it's an additive effect going forward. And that's why it becomes such a, a long-term burden and we end up needing to divert patients from one hospital to another. We have staff that is overworked and exhausted. So. Yeah, and you would say, um, Dr. Box, we still haven't seen, you, you mentioned lag, we still haven't seen what the effect of Thanksgiving, mm -hmm. I know it seems like it's in the past, sure, but we don't know right now to the extent of, that's still coming. Right. And your point, and I, and I have this discussion a lot throughout the day, um, People see daily numbers, but it's the additive effect. It's on top of. And so while some may be getting out of the discharged, what is the total? And that's that's why we track that seven day or fourteen day mm -hmm. number. Rachel, Kayla Sullivan, Fox fifty nine. Afternoon, Kayla. Good afternoon. Could I get your reaction to the 55,000 doses, that number? Is that something that you are pleased with? Were you wanting more? When might we see a second shipment and um, how much? I know you guys had to make that initial request. Um, was that the initial request or is this what you're expecting? It's, it's, what, we're, it's what we're told. And so therefore, yes, expecting. Um, am I, did you say happy? Uh, no, I'd like to have a lot more, but um, but I understand we're dealing with a set volume or a set approved production, and and that's going to be shipped out to all over the country. As I mentioned, I was on the phone last night with um, multiple governors, and we get it, and that number changes as we've got two, well, soon to be, I hope, two um, approved. But then there's two shortly thereafter, and they're different. You know, one doesn't require two doses. So, I mean, to keep this in perspective as well, I, I, I've not shared this with Dr. Box. This is not a medical <laughs> description, but, you know, with, with Pfizer or Dr. Weaver, with Pfizer, you know, you're, you're getting – it's like you ordered a pair of shoes, and you're getting the left shoe, and you got to wait till the second <laughs> dose or the second shoe a month later for this to be effective. And so when you mentioned 55,000 – that's 55,000 for for half of what you need right and 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 so yeah we want we're looking forward to moderna and yeah we're looking forward to j and j and yeah we're looking forward to the the, the others coming online but again um, what i'm pleased about is once we get it here we have uh, the protocol put in place, and we've practiced. So we're gonna, we're not, we're not gonna spill or waste precious life-saving resources when they get here. And and I'll be cheering from the cheap seats, saying, "Bring us, give us more, give us more, give us more." I'll be greedy about it if I could be. But uh, you know, this is this is a this is formulaic. Dr. Weaver, you want to clean up anything that I just created? I think you said it all perfectly. So this first week we know is only going to be Pfizer. And if the everything continues to move forward with Moderna, we expect that next week to get Pfizer and Moderna and for it to be an, a much bigger amount. We just don't know exactly what that is. So we're only sharing with you what we were allocated and everything that we're allocated we're going to push out. It is what we are expecting just based on what we knew that first week was going to look like and we were going to get our population dose. And we're ready to do it and we're excited. Yeah. And, and would you just say... Real quickly, again, you did last week, but in, in terms of not wasting or spilling about um, the saturation rate and being able to move on so we're not, if we don't go through 55, we will, but if we don't go through 55, how we move that forward? 
Right. So we'll be paying very close attention, not only overall for all the sites, but even at the sites. We've asked for them to have people available on hold, ready to get the vaccine in case there's two extra doses at the end of the day because people didn't show up, for example. And then on top of that, as we're monitoring that every single day, if we add, we're going to be able to add on more populations once we get to a, a saturation rate and we know, OK, we think we have gotten everybody in this group that is wanting and willing to get the vaccine and we're going to start recruiting more people to come in and get it. Yeah, and that's a, that's what we're going to have to balance too as as this unfolds is we have x hundred thousand healthcare workers in the state of Indiana. Not all of them are going to say Thanks. I want the vaccine. Right. And hopefully more folks are encouraged when they see their counterparts getting vaccinated and, mm -hmm. and then not contracting. Max Lewis, WSBT. Afternoon, Max. Good afternoon, Governor. How are you? Good. How about yourself? I'm doing well, thanks. Um, my two questions are probably uh, for Dr. Weaver. They're on the vaccine front. I wanted to know first how the decision was made on those initial hospitals that are getting the vaccine first. I didn't hear any sort of really close to the South Bend Elkhart metro area and just wondering about that because, you know, we are one of the, the big population centers in the state. And then my other question was just about how the state or what the state is doing to um, help local health departments or help local hospitals, maybe in rural areas, as far as infrastructure that's needed to store the vaccine, distribute it, and if that's, you know, a problem that you've heard of lately. Sure. So how our first initial five hospitals um, were identified is that they had to have the ultra cold storage because we didn't know if we would have the vaccine and the need to delay a couple of days while we are waiting for additional recommendations. For example, the expectation is, though, that everything's going to run in line by time it is delivered here, that we will be able to start vaccinating right away. So that's partly why those five hospitals were chosen. And again, we wanted them geographically spread across the state and we were limited to five. So we had to stick to five places. Places. All those other additional hospitals, the hospitals were, were given a, a survey asking about their ability to vaccinate their healthcare personnel as well as the healthcare personnel within their communities and also their ability to have ultra cold storage, but that wasn't a requirement. So these vaccines are going to become, are going to come in thermal shippers that will actually be able to keep the vaccines on dry ice. So they don't have to have any additional equipment there to be able to provide the vaccine. Additionally, they're gonna be coming with ancillary supplies to help um, support give the vaccine, except for a, a couple exceptions. For example, um, gloves is something that's needed, needed by those hospitals. So we're working really, um, carefully with them, with any kind of information that we get from the CDC. We have planners that are working with every single facility and helping them decide how to, to plan, space out patients, scheduling, registration. So they're getting a significant amount of support. And we've already started our next phase of communication to all the additional places that we're going to add on, the rest of the hospitals in the state, local health departments, FQHCs, community health centers, et cetera, so that we can very quickly expand the number of places um, people can go and get the vaccine. Sherry with the Indianapolis. Hey, can, I think Max, uh, I think Mac, uh, Lindsay, Max also asked about lo uh, help to local health departments and in rural areas uh, in terms of the vaccine vaccine. Max, you want to ask that question again if you're still with us, if not? Yeah, well, yeah. I, I think she's, I think uh, Dr. Weaver sort of touched on it. Just okay. as they don't necessarily need the equipment because it's coming shipped in that. Is that right? I was just wondering as far as That's I don't, I think some rural hospitals and rural areas might not have the same ultra cold freezers that some major population centers would have. Right, exactly. They're going to be receive all the things that they need in order to provide the vaccine to the community. So that that was not a barrier. Gotcha. Sherry Thanks. with the Indianapolis Star. Afternoon, Sherry. Good afternoon. I have a I actually I have two questions. I think the first is is probably for Dr. Weber or Dr. Box. Um, if the fifty five thousand plus doses, is that going to be sufficient to vaccinate all of the healthcare workers? And if not, how are you going to decide who gets who gets that among you know that that full pool of healthcare workers? And then the second question I have um, comes from my colleagues who are looking into the way Indiana funds its nursing homes. Uh, they point out there's an FSA Division of Aging plan that was going to offer Hoosiers more home care and tie nursing home money to quality that the Holcomb administration yeah. scrapped in 2017. 
They, they ask, um, you've never acknowledged the systemic problems with how Indiana funds its nursing homes. Is the nursing home system here broken? And do you accept any responsibility? And if so, what will you do to fix it? I think Dr. Dan will answer all eight of those questions. But first, <laughs> uh, first, Sherry, your first question. Healthcare people, will 55,000 55 be cover enough? it. Do you want that? Or do you, Dr. Weaver? Lindsay will yeah, probably yeah, okay. take that one. It's, right. it's not near enough. Yeah. <laughs> No, it, it's not enough. So we're estimating we have somewhere in the range of 400,000 people who would meet the criteria for healthcare workers. And I want to emphasize again, this is not just doctors and nurses. These are the people, that dietary people that bring the food into rooms. These are people that clean the rooms. Um, the, the clergy, the social worker who comes and sees patients um, in hospitals or in long-term care facilities. So it is much more than what you would typically think about as the clinicians. And so while it is 55,000 and that is not enough, um, we do hope that we will have enough over the next several weeks in order to vaccinate all the health care personnel that are wanting and willing to get the vaccine. But like I said, we just don't have the projection. So this is week one, and we're going to see what we're going to get week two, and we're going to keep moving forward. Because it is a smaller amount, that very first week, the invitation to get registered and get the vaccine is going directly to the hospitals across the state, and then we'll go to our long-term care staff. And then as we continue to monitor the uptake, as we had mentioned earlier, we will then expand that to our outpatient providers. Yeah, and I, I would just say, um, and Dr. Dan, I think you're available, but um, Sherry, I would just I would just say that I'm, I'm glad we're having this discussion about 55,000. It's not enough. I mean, it's we got, a, like I mentioned, hundreds of thousands um, to go, but we're having this conversation in December of 2020. Mm -hmm. And typically we'd be talking about when do we get our first 55,000 doses eight years from now or four years from now or 34 years from now so it doesn't take the sting out of it or the tough you know the challenge out of it for sure but we're prepared for when it does arrive and it is arriving soon and for that i think we're blessed dr dan you want to take and i mean i'll take full responsibility for anything that happens in indiana that we're that we oversee uh, but you want to answer her technical questions yeah oh um I won't have you go through them again, but if I don't answer them all, feel free to uh, you know, ask them and I'll clarify it. So in terms of what we're doing and, and how we're looking at long-term services and supports in the state of Indiana, first of all, you're correct. Uh, we've been looking at this since even prior to 2017. Um, really one of our goals in the state is how do we assure that we get the right care to the right individual at the right place at the right time. And in terms of uh, LTSS, that means for those individuals who can receive care in their home, how do we facilitate that uh, better? And so right now, as we mentioned several weeks ago, we have a program uh, that we're piloting with several providers throughout the state for uh, increasing the speed at which we determine somebody is eligible for home and community-based services and getting them those services in their home faster. And so we're going to continue to expand that pilot through our Division of Aging, uh, and we would hope uh, as we get the information, the data from that, that that's something that we could, uh, as this pandemic uh, ends, permanently embed into the way we do uh, LTSS services. What we don't want to be an impediment to individuals is the time it takes to get care in their home, and therefore uh, forcing them uh, to not have decisions uh, about where they receive their care. In terms of the whole financial system, in terms of long-term care, uh, we have been working with uh, leaders uh, throughout the state and throughout the LTSS community uh, since uh, last year and before to look at Indiana's LTSS services and look at the way we pay for it and the way we deliver care. Uh, I think as COVID has hit, I think we are reevaluating that as well and will continue to do so. I think you can't uh, be in the middle of this pandemic and not think about ways that we could be providing care to uh, high risk and older individuals better. And we're going to continue to do so uh, throughout this pandemic. And we'll be looking to see what changes we need to put in place uh, as it ends. Rob Burgess with the Wabash Plain Dealer. Afternoon, Rob. Good Rob. afternoon, Governor. Uh, welcome to the Facial Hair Club. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Dr. Box, yesterday I heard from our mayor who uh, correctly predicted that our local rating would fall from red to orange in the latest figures released today. He expressed concern that with the change, people might let their guards down and that part of the recent decrease in local positivity ratings was partially as a result of the increased re restrictions with which the red rating brought. 
Do you share those concerns as counties move up and down in the state's rate ratings? Absolutely, and that's why we're requiring an individual county to be in that color for a minimum of two weeks before they would consider changing anything. And that's why I really focus on the number of cases uh, per 100,000, and that map is totally red. So in that circumstance, I would consider your community spread to be high, and I would continue to conduct myself in the same way um, with regards to the red um, metric. Thank you for joining today's briefing. Governor Holcomb's next briefing will be next Wednesday at 2.30 p.m. Eastern.